it's really developing those use cases. When is it appropriate to use AI? When is it not? And then being helping people understand that clear delineation. So it might be that you don't use AI when you're doing XYZ as a function of a school. Welcome back to another episode of the PowerCast. We're here live in San Antonio, ISTE 2025. My guest, Julia Fallon, is a policy wonk. I'm not going to call you that, but somebody else somebody did. Somebody Yeah, I'll take that. I'll own that. But will you introduce and share a little bit about your title, your role at the state level, and how you're supporting uh, districts? Sure. I am the executive director of an organization called CEDA. It stands for the State Ed Tech Directors Association. And we are a small and mighty professional association of state level ed tech and digital learning leaders from across the country. Um, and uh, I used to be a state member before I actually joined uh, staff uh, at uh, CETA, and I represented Washington State back in the day. Excellent. Okay, so other than AI, what are the big topics right now at the state level? Uh, cybersecurity. I talk a lot about cybersecurity and the need for uh, resources and money and funding and people and all of those good things to keep our network secure and so that kids can not get their school shut down and they can still continue learning and all of that good stuff. I think there was also like this idea that, well, no one's going to touch K-12. Why would they touch K-12? I'm like, well, identity theft. Like yeah. that's a big deal, right? Yeah. Like for 18 years, you could have somebody's kids data and, you know. Oh, I mean, well, well like a, a soft target with uh, a, l a large chance of outrage that would get people to pay and g make it go away exactly, as quickly, right? Exactly, exactly. But also it's lucrative, I think, from the the, yeah. the the persons that are stealing the data, right? They could, they, no one's gonna, no one's checking their ch children's credit reports every year to see if somebody's taken <laughs> out a true. mortgage or a car, right? So, I mean, financial fraud and that sort of thing. But we are woefully under resourced as a um, sector. I mean, higher ed's doing a better job because they have more of, you know, that network, sure. uh, research and education network kind of thing. But um, I think we're, hopefully we're getting better, better in place and trying to put in those mitigation strategies that will help everybody across the country. Do you think it's a, a, a solve internally or solve by using uh, uh, services outside of the district, what's the best methodology you've kind of seen in terms of preparing? Well, I think with any kind of cybersecurity stuff, it's it's layered strategies, right? Mm. So um, we often at the at CEDAR are talking about what what's the state's role. Um, like for all, give ex a, get, I'll give an example that like Connecticut has bought DDoS software for all their schools and libraries, okay. right? So that does now come now that doesn't come out of a district's budget, right? So they're offsetting that, and that's a good strategy. There's other things that maybe an educational service district could be doing, right, on behalf of a region, because you might be tiny or a small district. You're not going to hire a cybersecurity person. Right. You, they could be handling 12 of them, like, you know, doing some kind of things. Ah, so it's kind of like a, a hub that out there. Sort of, yeah, distributed yeah. model of personnel. But it really depends on your resources of your district. If you're an L.A., you know, unified school district, you probably have four or five people that are doing this, yes. like, dedicated, right? Just it really depends on what you have. Um, but. But really looking at what works, we have a lot of examples of states coming together. Uh, I think it's uh, Missouri uh, has a cybersecurity incident team that comes in and works with the district after it happens, you know, to see what happened and maybe help strengthen stuff. So it's just it's lots of different ways to approach the problem. What do, what do you find that the legislators, their blind spots are when talking about this stuff? I th again, I think it's like, why would you need anything in K-12? Who's uh. like doing the <laughs> K-12 thing? And I think. I always feel, and I don't know if, what it is, and this is just my gut speaking, sure. like, I feel like we're, K-12 has been taught, like, felt as, like, a less than, like, oh, well, they can have the leftovers. They could have the leftover company computers. Those yeah. are good enough. This is public sector, so, This yeah. is public sector. We don't need to give them the good stuff. We don't need to, you know, research. And I'm like, no, we do. We actually really do need to do that. Yeah. You know what I mean? We just don't want to send, I, we talked about doing an apprenticeship ship program with computer science and, and cybersecurity, you know, for colleges, and then they'll, they'll, do it in this district and then they go off to Google and like, why can't they stay in the district and continue to grow as a professional in the space, right? Yes. It, I guess it's that less than, and I don't know how to change that. We, should, we, we deserve just as good IT support and resources as any other sector. Well, yeah, and that you're absolutely, I, I agree 100% with what your gut is saying. Uh, it's a little scary because if we're all saying that our most valuable asset are our children, Right. And what is our checkbook saying? And it, we're not we're saying with our mouth, but not necessarily with our checkbook all of the time. You know, thinking about A.I., how are states processing, leveraging, backing up from? I guess it's, it's probably a range of all of those. What's the the big talk 
for, from legislators uh, about artificial intelligence? I think right now it's just establishing the policy and maybe the sandbox that we're going to work in. Um, I had the fortunate luck of sitting next to the uh, the gentleman that runs AI for the Department of Defense on a flight from oh, Seattle wow. to okay. Washington D.C. Right Would with no ask? middle seat, and I was like, "So tell me, like, is, is, is he probably? Is he? He's gonna, probably. And of course, I'm trying to look at my phone to make sure he's really who he is, and he's not yeah, like yeah. lying to me. But he legit and everything else. I said, "What advice would you give to K-12? You're the Department of Defense. Yeah. Like, help. you get to see all of it first. You get to right? see it, right? And you get to see some crazy stuff. I'm yeah. pretty sure, even more so than we would see. And he said, "It's really developing those use cases. When is it appropriate to use AI? When is it not? And then being helping people understand." that clear delineation. So it might be that you don't use AI when you're doing XYZ um, as a function of a school, but it, maybe it's appropriate to do it when you are doing, you know what I mean? And just having those types of things, you can't, because you can't regulate it up the gazoo because by the time you write it, it's changed a little bit, right? AI is one of those sort of morphing technologies that, we're, that we haven't really seen before, but we also know what it's like to have an emerging technology in the space and to do all the due diligence that we See, need to do. That was my belief that it was unlike the internet because of the speed that it was changing, right? So by the time you spend two years in Texas, spend two years trying to develop policy behind it, you're, you're about 18 months yep. too slow because it's all just changed. Yep. Um, so I, I, it'll be interesting to see how the legislators adapt to the speed of it when there's not the adjustment in the in the law and the policy. Well, the interesting though thing is, are you talking about state legislators or are you talking about federal legislators? All of it, all because, the above. I mean, when you look at the average age of a federal legislator, um, especially like in the Senate, we're talking about people that don't really understand maybe, maybe the technology as much as a younger one, maybe just be using more technology and everything else. Right. And, and also they have different ideas of what school looks like. Um, and we often talk about these high skill, high wage jobs that don't exist yet. And I'm like, hello, people, doctors, farmers, firefighters, uh, nurses, you know, lawyers, uh, small business owners, they're all going to be using AI in some capacity. And those are the jobs that we need that kids are going to want and they're going to be doing when they leave our system, how do we prepare them to integrate it into there? Ideally, it should save us stuff on the front end, right? It should save us yeah. stuff on the You're, on the business absolutely. side so that you can pay more teachers. If I can save, you know, money on the front office and and not just digitize what we've been doing before, but and I've been talking about this, it's a modernization of our sector. And you really have to think about systems and how they work together and they're seamless and they're interoperable. Golly, I love that. Yep. Okay, I'll, I'll get you out of here on this last one. <laughs> All right, you've got you're hosting a party. Mm -hmm. You've got you get the pick of celebrities, your top five celebrities that you would ever want to bring to your party, and you have to DJ for them. What are your three go to tracks right off the bat? Like oh, right. tracks. Like I was gonna, I thought you were gonna ask me like celebrities. And I'm like, oh, no, no, that's no. a really hard one. No, 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 no. It just just My you know go to tracks. Like, like you, you haven't met them, and before you get to mingle, you've got to play three songs to get them like. Get all right, them all. This, yeah, yeah. What, what are you going to? I'm going to go with Inner Bloom by Rufus de Soul. Okay. Because that is a classic. If, if, I will figure out who the house heads are by <laughs> playing that song. Like, if they all of a sudden get on the floor and like, oh, my God. I'm like, those are my people. Uh, so that would be one. Okay. Uh, I think another song I would play, and it's hard because I love Gorgon City. They're a UK uh, DJ duo. Uh, and we should be – I'm primarily a – like, tech house is my thing. Um, I want to say I would probably hmm, – that's a hard one. These are hard questions. Know, the sorry, last ones you that on you're spot, stumping me, I like tracks by. by uh, I would probably. I, I would. There's a lot of Gorgon. It would really depend on the vibe of the mood in your room. If they were all kind you, of you a little more subdued, right? They would be a little bit. Yeah, that, thing. You know, but like, if it was like they're ready to party, <laughs> you know, it might be a song like you know. Well, they just they just released a song with John Summit called you know are you know the party are you ready for the party yet or something like that. And that's I actually had a set last uh, Wednesday and I played it and everybody loved it and everything else and. Um, I love a um, DJ called Odd Mob out of Australia, and he's got a really great remix of um, Sean Paul's, you know, uh, uh, song there. And that would just because people can recognize it yes. if they don't know it, That's they a, would get up, and that has a bass line that just punches you in the chest, which is what I love. You heard it here first on the Powercast. <laughs> We're talking policy and 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 DJ, and so you're not going to get that anywhere else. So. Thank you so much for jumping in Thank unexpectedly and, and talking a little bit of policy, but also having a little bit of fun and love your perspective. So keep up the great work. Thank you. And thank you for having me. Absolutely. Join us next time on the PowerCast. <laughs>